Good morning, and good morning. welcome to uh, this last session of the series on what is faith. We've all had um, trips overseas or interstate in a car or a plane or something like that, and we've come back with photos of wonderful things and the things we've seen. There's another journey we can take where we don't have to leave home and we don't have to look for anything particular. It is the journey of faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much. And we thank you that you call us to trust you. For as we open our lives to you, you change us. Lord, lead us by your spirit this morning, we pray, as we consider this thing, this important issue. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The most powerful journey we can take in life is faith. The journey of faith. We can't live without faith. We can't get on a bus without trusting the driver. We trust our doctors to care for us. We trust those who make our food for us. The people who make the ice cream and the ladies who make the cakes for morning tea. We trust people and we need to trust people. We need to have faith. It's part of life. Faith is something that grows as we choose to trust. You, you can't prove love, but faith is rather like love. You can't prove it, but it's vital for life. And it starts with a step of faith. In 1859, there was a man called Blondin who did something everyone believed was impossible. He walked across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Let's have a look. At the clip. There he is. Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondie, was a famous tightrope walker and acrobat. He's perhaps best known for his many crossings of the tightrope, 1,100 feet in length, suspended 160 feet above Niagara Falls in the USA. His act would be watched by large crowds and begin with a relatively simple crossing using a balancing rod. Then he would throw away the pole and amaze the audience. On one occasion, he crossed the tightrope on sticks. On another occasion, blindfolded. Another time, he stopped halfway to cook and eat an omelette. In 1860, a royal party from England came to watch Blondin perform. After his normal spectacular crossings, he then wheeled a wheelbarrow from one side to the other as the crowd cheered. Next, he put a sack of potatoes into the wheelbarrow and wheeled that across. And cheered all night. Then he approached the royal party and asked the Duke of Newcastle, Do you believe that I could take a man across the tiger in this wheelbarrow? Yes, I do, said the Duke. Ah, hop in! <laughs> the crowd fell silent. But the Duke of Newcastle would not accept Blondin's challenge. Is there anyone else here who believes I could do it? asked Blondin. No one was willing to volunteer. Eventually, an old woman stepped out of the crowd and climbed into the wheelbarrow. Blondin wheeled her all the way across and all the way back. The old woman was Blondin's mother, the only person willing to put her life in his hands. Trust in God. In the creed, 
we are not just saying, I believe God exists and made heaven and earth. We are saying, I put my faith in God, the Father, who is the maker of heaven and earth. I put my faith in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who gave me life. I put my faith in the Holy Spirit, who lives in me. I like to, when I was saying the creed, I like to put that in my mind, that little phrase, I put my trust in, instead of just thinking that this is a, an issue of head knowledge. It's relational. The whole of Christianity is about relating to God. So, what is faith? Well, in, in the book of Genesis, we read the story of Abraham. The Lord said, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. <coughs> now Abraham was an old man. He and his wife had no children. They weren't able to have children. But he obeyed. He obeyed in an extraordinary way. He didn't even know where he was going. God had said, I will lead you to a, a land and I will make you a great nation. Extraordinary. He didn't have children. They couldn't have children. But God was going to make him a great nation. He was going to have many children. He believed God. That was the level of the faith of Abraham. He became called the father of faith. The father of all people who have faith. So trusting God, he just set out. Trusted God to lead him. Trusted God to provide for him everything he needed. So this is the sort of picture that we have of our being called to a journey of faith. It starts as we come to the cross of Jesus. It starts as we put our trust in Him, as we give our lives to Him, as we recognise that we're not worthy of Him, but we trust Him to, take, to deal with our sin, to deal with our failures, to provide for us, to lead us. We invite God to break into our lives, to, to fulfil His purposes in our lives. We're not just uh, ants. We're not just uh, creatures uh, with no particular meaning. God has created us for a purpose, to fulfill our lives that He created beyond our imagining, to be children of God. So it involves faith, but it involves growing in faith. It involves getting to know Him, get to know His Word, read what He says, Get to know the promises God has made. The Bible is so full of so many promises. Not only that he would love us and provide for us, but he would guide us. That he will uh, um, build things through our lives. That he is with us in every situation. There's so many promises that he makes. And invites us to take those promises and sort of cash them in and say, Lord, you promised this. I put my trust in you to fulfil it. He invites us to share our lives with him in prayer. Prayer is a, a journey of faith as well. Trusting him with the things of the daily life, the things of our relationship to our families and our work and wherever we are. He wants to be involved in every part of our lives. We can share that in prayer. Prayer for those who are in need and those who are sick. He invites us to trust him to guide and provide for us in our lives. Our lives are not just uh, uh, wandering through life, uh, doing this and doing that. He wants us to follow him into things that are meaningful, things that change not only our lives, but other people's lives, to contribute. Western civilization is such a great uh, movement that we enjoy in Australia, that has come out of the Bible. It's come out of people who trusted Jesus and who have lived with him and shared the truth and the power of God 
the love of God and the wisdom of God into society to, to lead us to faith, to freedom and to have our democracy that we have. It comes out of the Bible, it comes out of people of faith trusting him. He invites us to believe he will provide for us as we trust him in our family, in the church, in our community. He trusts us to thank him, to thank him that he is with us. Because the more we thank him, the more we look for what he's doing in our lives, the more we see how faithful he is, and the closer we grow to him, the more we grow in faith. He also invites us to share our faith in Jesus with others who don't know him. He invites us to get to know him to the point that we want to share what God is doing in our lives, that others may come to believe. He wants us to apply our faith to our lives. And a basic example of living by faith is being sure we are forgiven. When we put our faith in Jesus on the cross, we receive, receive eternal life and faith. We've talked about that over this series. When we trust our lives to him, when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and set us free. We're a fantastic gift. We can know we are forgiven because of his faithfulness. But then, at times we fail. As Christians, at times we do things that are wrong. We make mistakes. We give in to temptation. And at those sort of times we start to think, well, we failed God. Well, how can he forgive me now? And we feel guilty. We feel ashamed. How can we feel forgiven again or still? We've, we've let him down and we feel condemned. That's not an uncommon thing to happen for Christians. But that's when we need to know the promises of God. God has made so many promises in the scriptures. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Paul says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once we come to him and give our lives to him at the cross, surrender to him, recognize that we've failed, but trust him to forgive us and give us a new life, we are no longer condemned, and even when we fail, even when we sin, even when we do things that are silly or hurtful, we don't need to be afraid he's pushing us out. We need to come back to him and to confess our sin. In John's first epistle, John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do fail, but let's not worry about that. Let's just come back. This is this whole thing about trusting Jesus. He loves us. He'll always love us. He invites us to come as we are, wherever we are, and put our trust in him. And we want, he wants us to claim these promises for ourselves, to trust the promises he's made, the faithfulness he is. Fourthly, it involves inviting him to take us beyond what we can do by ourselves, beyond what we can be by ourselves. We all are largely average Christians, average people. Uh, we can achieve a certain amount on our own and we can do things to help people. But God says, I want to lead you beyond what you can do. To be open to what God can do through us. He can cause us to be open to a life that includes the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. We read in the Gospel this morning, the Apostles were in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and a storm blew up at night and Jesus wasn't with them. 
And then they see Jesus coming, walking on the water, and they're afraid. They're spooked. They think it's a ghost. Jesus said, oh, it's me. Don't worry. It's all okay. Don't be afraid. And they're so relieved, of course. And then Peter, inspired by the moment, says, Lord, if you tell me to come out of the boat and walk on the water, I will. I'll come to you. Jesus said, yep, do come. And Peter stepped out of the boat and started walking on the water. An extraordinary picture. Here is Peter, certainly an average sort of character, walking on the water. A miracle. Why? Why was, it, why was he able to do that? Because Jesus was there and because Peter put his trust in Jesus. And he was able to walk on this water. But as with all of us at times, we think, I couldn't do that. What, what, am, I, what am I doing? I, I, I can't do this. I'm doing something I can't do. And we put our trust in ourselves. And there's not much hope there. And he started to sing. But Jesus said, why don't you trust me? And took his hand and lifted him up and they walked to the boat and got in. You see, we're created to be people who have the presence of God, the power of God in our lives to do things beyond our own ability. We all think, I couldn't do that. We, we hear of people who have done extraordinary things and we think, we couldn't do that. And either we don't do something when God calls us. Sometimes we might just get an inkling that God's calling us to do something big or different. Something we really couldn't do, but we'll keep thinking, God, why are you putting that in my mind? It's because God wants us sometimes to step out of the boat. And sometimes we, we don't do that. Because we think, no, I couldn't. <coughs> or we say to God, okay, if you really call me to do that, you will make it happen. That's pretty scary. I don't know how it's going to happen. But if you make it happen, I'll have a go. So we need to be pretty sure it's uh, God calling us to do it, not just a great idea that we'll... They do it ourselves because that's sure to fail. Now I've had experiences like that where I have sensed God calling me to do things that I had no idea about. I'm, I'm a chemical engineer by trade. I was a development engineer. I was working in the industry in Melbourne. And various things started to happen in my life that suggested I might go into the ministry. And Maybe God's calling me to be ordained, and I thought, no, I don't, I don't think that could happen. But the sense of call wouldn't go away. Someone I work with, who I hardly knew, said to me one day at work, do you think you'll be a minister one day? <laughs> I don't talk to anyone about being a minister. I mean, I, this is really out of left field. I thought, where did that come from? Oh, I know where that came from. It's God saying something. You know, stirred me up again. And I, a few other things like that happened. And I prayed a lot about it. And I thought, well, I'll, uh, I'll go to the, the bishop's uh, selection conference about to see what they think, whether I should be a minister. Would they confirm my call from God? So I went along to this conference where they put you through all sorts of hoops and tests and see whether you're capable or whether they think that you're called to be a minister. And... They came in and said, Rob, we think you should be ordained. So I resigned my job and I believe God would provide a leader. And the obvious thing for me was to study at Ridley College. I'd actually been living at Ridley College for a while and I thought, oh, well, that's obviously where I'll study. But as I got closer to it, I thought, I think I should study in England. But how could I afford that? I mean, that was a massive, that was many years ago. And I, I prayed a lot about it and I still thought, no, I feel I should study in England. So I thought, how can I do that? I haven't got much money. And so I prayed and I, I made a list of all the things I had and all the bits of money and other things. And I added it all up and I just had enough 
for a fair to England. And the diocese gave me some money to study, so I thought, that's a confirmation. God wants me to study in England. And he opened every door. I was even given a, an Australian travel scholarship out of the blue to help me. And my time in England was extraordinary. In college, I met the, the people who write the books that we study in Australia. Yeah. It was a, a wonderful experience for me. And the result was I had an amazing sense. God really knows me. God has led me to do something I couldn't do. He loves me. And this is what he wants for all of us. He wants all of us to trust him to do things that are beyond us. Because when we do that, we discover how much he loves us. How much his hand is on our lives to bless us and to lift us up and to bless others through us. And so when he called me to step out of the boat again, which he's done on a number of occasions, I stepped out and trusted him and experienced God's faithfulness in amazing ways. And my faith just grows. That's the plan he has for you and me. I believe he wants all of us to step out of the boat sometimes and just get to know how real it is. Get to know how much he loves us. Of course, it's all to make a step of faith in some way. Things to do, to do things we find scary. To trust him in small ways and even in big things. Some people never step out of the boat, never really trust him. Never really expect God to intervene in their lives. And to put aside that little sense sometimes that he gives us that we should do things. And we either tr uh, try to fix things ourselves, but we just, or we just give in because it's beyond us. So we can miss out in experiencing how it really is and how he is with us. A number of those things are in front of us continually. One of those things is giving by faith. God created the heavens and the earth. We, we know God is, owns everything. He can do everything. We know that God loves us and that Jesus died for us. God is the one who's given us everything we have. And he also says, when I give you things, I want you to be a steward of it. It's not just for you. It's to use for others as well, to share some people grab everything, hold everything, and use everything, and, and hold everything into themselves. But God says, no, if you take what I've given you, and you share it with those around you, just be open for me to lead you where you might give, where, who you might care for, what you might share with others. And you do that in faith. I will be able to give you more. But if you hang on to everything I've got, I can't give you anymore. And you won't know how much I want you to be a channel of my grace and my generosity to others. Part of that is through the church. God calls us to be part of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is Jesus' hands and feet and ears to our community. We are the ones who can share things that God's given us with others who know nothing about him, who can receive gifts from God in, in ways of food and money and other things that we have, share it with other people who don't have it, that they might know God loves them too. And if we do that, God can bless us with more and we grow in faith. We are enriched by his presence and we get more and more excited about who he is. The Bible in the New Testament calls us to give a proportion of our income, a regular income, to, into his kingdom. And usually, regularly that means to support the community of faith that we belong to. It also means to give to those in need or to give to particular causes as God calls us, doesn't mean we give money to everyone who asks because that's impossible. But pray about it. Maybe God is calling you 
I'm sure he's calling all of us to consider, God, what should I be giving into the church? There's a guideline of a tenth. Now, not everyone feels up to that to start with, but it's a challenge before us. Give us a tenth of our income and see if God doesn't continue to provide all we need. But whatever it is, it's give something significant beyond what we're comfortable with or what we would like to hold on to ourselves and, and spend for ourselves. And as you give more than you just would do by, you know, yeah, I'll give a few bob, that sort of stuff, that, that's not very meaningful. If we go beyond that, we give at a faith level, God will provide more for us and enrich our lives. That's the call of us as members of St. Augustine's. That's our call as members of our society. To trust God with what we have, to share it with others. It's true in many other ways. To love by faith. Love those who don't love us. God will give us love for them. To forgive by faith. We don't like forgiving, it's very hard to do. Sometimes particularly hard. But God forgave us. He says, as I have forgiven you, forgive others. Trust me to forgive through you. It's this whole relationship of the loving God, loving others through us. Living by faith includes sharing our faith with those around us and trusting God to give us the opportunity and the way to speak. We don't have to know the Bible backwards. We don't have to know a lot. We just say, God, give me a few words to say. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead you to share what you is appropriate at the time. There are so many ways for us to trust him, to live in faith, by faith. That's our call. That's our privilege. That's the glory of God in our midst. Let's pray. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't just lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your steps. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and gave your life. You died in faith. You trusted us with this love. Trusting us to give it away. Lord, strengthen our faith. Help us to be a people of faith, individually and together. We give our lives to you again, into your hands in faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.